You may turn your scriptures to Luke 18. God bless you and welcome to the Heart of Christ Church, where we know God is good and all the time. We also know that through the word of Jesus Christ, God the Father has called us to love him, love others, and go with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In these three things, the entirety of the scriptures is summed up that we may know and be Christ's ambassadors to the world. So today, we're gonna look at a scripture here, just one of several, that we're going to answer the question, is your cup half full or half empty? Now that's something that, that many of us, especially as Christians, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna upset some folks here today. As Christians, we always look at it and we say, oh, well, you know, I, I don't look at it as, as being half empty. It's, it's always half full. Really? Do you act that way? Okay, I think it's funny because as Christians we want to pontificate the wonder of it all. But in the secret place of our lives, 90% of us, 90% of the time, think it's half empty and getting lower. And that's a sad reality because I'm gonna show you something here today that I think we all need to grab a hold of and as a Christian, it's something that I need to deal with, and I'm gonna share that with you. Because one of the things that I, I want everybody to understand, a lot of people have said to me, oh, pastor, man, how do you preach those scriptures right at me where I am? Because where I'm preaching, God has me. I have to live out every sermon I preach. I don't know whether you all know that or not. I love my Lord. But one of the things he requires of his men and women is that we live the word. We live the word. And I'll share what's going on in my life and whether my cup is half full or half empty in just a few moments. Turn your Bibles to the book of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 18. We're going to begin in the 18th verse. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is out teaching and a rich young man comes up to him. And in verse 18, we read these words. A ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, who can be saved? But Jesus said, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. And Peter, impetuous Peter, said, Behold, we have left our own homes and follow you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. Then he took the twelve aside. As we look at this word, there are a whole lot of things I could teach out of this word. There's a whole lot that I could bring out of here. You know, we could talk about what does it mean that, you know, uh, for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle, right? There's been all kinds of weird teachings on that one. 
I'm not worried about camels going through the eyes of needles. I look to life and the life that we all have to live. And according to what God has given us, where do we see ourselves? And how do we see the things that God has given us? Hence, is your cup half full or half empty? Because you see, the first thing I want us all to understand is the very first principle that we have to apply is the principle of perspective. Where do I see things? Now, how many of you know what the strongest part of that statement is? It's one word, and it's one letter. I, I. That is a powerful word because it deals with the self. It deals with everything that we are and everything that we aren't. And then it tries to possess everything that we don't own anyway. What do you mean I don't own it? I bought that car. Your life is going to end. Somebody else is going to end up with that car and that house and that bank account if you don't spend it all. Nothing on earth lasts forever. Nothing on earth lasts forever. But we lay claim to it. Because we know when, when we were little, when we were kids, you know, we knew we didn't have anything. Mom and dad had it all, right? But today, I want you to think about that perspective because we see a different perspective. Now we see young people who have what mom and dad has because mom and dad are affording it to them. So it's theirs. I didn't grow up with that perspective. My parents would not allow me to grow up with that perspective. I can remember my dad because I, I, the one day I chased him out of my bedroom, okay? Y'all never did that kind of stuff, right? This is my room, get out of here! And my dad looked at me and left the room and he came back with the mortgage book to the house. And he says, is your name on here? And I got smart. I said, yes it is. Because he was Richard L. Dubbs Sr., I'm Richard L. Dubbs Jr. He said, sorry, sunshine, I'm senior, not you. His point was this. Everything I had was simply a blessing being afforded to me by my parents. Everything we have is a blessing being afforded to us by our heavenly parent. You and I work to bring these things into our lives. That's God showing us that there is a commonplace here. That yes, God's going to provide your blessings, but you have to be involved in it. This is not an ecology of, of entitlement. I do not deserve life. I deserve death. But Christ has given me life. I cannot look at that and say I deserve it. I have to look at it and say I deserve death, but I thank you for the gift of life. That's looking at the glass as half full because I know it should be empty. But one of the other things that I want us to understand is when we're looking at this, when we're understanding what's going on here, this rich young ruler, he had so much. And did you catch his answers here at first? All these things I have done. You know, he really puffed himself up. Number one, he called Jesus good. And as a Hebrew boy, he knew he shouldn't call anybody good because God alone is good. Okay, so Jesus rebuked him right away. We need to catch these little idioms that are in there. And then he has the audacity to say, oh, I've never sinned. Because that's what his statement means when we look at the second portion, when Jesus said, do all these things. Now let me ask you a question, folks. Let me ask you all a question. How many of you have honored your mother and father always? I like that, not a hand went in the air. Because isn't that the truth? How many of us have never stolen? How many of us have never lied? How many of us have never murdered? Oh, boy, hands will go up there. But Jesus said, if you have harbored hatred in your heart, you have murdered. We need to understand, our glass is empty. 
It is empty. It's not half empty. It is empty. God fills it up halfway. Why doesn't God fill your glass the whole way? Because number one, we would become so conceited. Look at this gentleman. He had all this, and yet he couldn't give it away. God knows that. He knows that if he gives us too much, we're going to cling to it rather than cling to him. In fact, he warned Israel about that when he established Israel. He said, remember me when you go into the land of milk and honey, houses that you have not built, vineyards that you have not planted, fields that you have not harrowed. For you will become fat and rich, and you will remember me no more. What happened in Israel? That is exactly what happened. That is what has happened in our nation. When our forefathers were here, they poured their lives out to God. Our forefathers built a nation harshly. I want you to think about that. They come into a harsh land, a land that was all trees, fallow ground, They took out the trees, they took out the rocks, and they made what we see around us now. Lebanon Valley, where we are at here, was not this lush land. It was a valley, but I'll guarantee you it was full of trees, and it all had to be rooted up and tilled down. It took generations to do all of that. Hard work, hard labor. When they were looking at it, do you think they looked at their glass as being half full or half empty? They looked at it as the blessing that it was. It was land. We need to look at our lives, not half full, half empty. It simply is. This is where we find ourselves. However, the perspective comes into play as to whether we are going to pour it out or hoard it. If we are going to look at our glass in a human sense and say, oh, it's half full, we're going to hoard it. But if we look at our glass and say, you know what, it's half empty, I'm going to pour it out because we know in Christ Jesus that as we pour out our lives, what does God do? He fills it back up, doesn't he? He fills it right back up. Because that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to share our passions, our compassions, our sympathies, our empathies. He wants us to be poured out as a drink offering. When you look at the offertory system that God set up all the way back at the beginning with the Hebrews, all of it was fulfilled in Christ Jesus when he went to the cross of Calvary. That's the way we're supposed to live our lives. We are to be, according to the book of Romans, we are to be a living sacrifice. Okay? So when we look at our lives, when we look at where we are in this context, half full, half empty, when we start playing that game, what we're doing is say, oh, poor me, or look how well I have it. That stuff's got to go. Number one, you don't own the glass. And you don't own the water that's in it, or Kool-Aid, or milk, or whatever you happen to prefer. You know, when I was growing up, there was an old Pennsylvania Dutch saying, and I'm not going to say it, but you all know what I'm thinking right now, because my grandpa used to say to me, how many of you know they used to have what they called night chambers in the houses before they had toilets, right? He said, you don't even have one of them to go in, okay, yeah, now y'all got it. For you folks out there on the internet, look it up. Because I'm gonna tell you, we don't. In and of ourselves, we have nothing. We are empty, we are void of even the glass to contain anything. But God gives us that glass. God gives us that vessel because we become that vessel. Some vessels are made for noble reasons, some for ignoble reasons. What does that mean? Some of us are meant to do things greater than others. But that does not mean that any life is less than any other. God determines the purpose. And are we going to see God's purpose as our call? And I'm going to get into that next week.
Yeah, this is a two-part. Actually, it'll be two weeks because next week we have our picnic. And Pastor David's going to be preaching at the picnic. But in two weeks, I'm going to look at that. But I want us to understand it all has to come down to perspective. Where do you see yourself? How do you view your life? I view my life as simply my life, where it is. And how I respond with God tells me whether it's half full or half empty. Because it's a God perspective that I need, not a human perspective. And a God perspective says, I want an empty glass that I can pour it full. And as he's pouring it full, we need to be pouring it out at the same time. That's the way we're to live our lives. It's not half full, it's not half empty. It's a continual cycle of being refilled, 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 refilled. That's where we need to be. But we have this way of being human and holding on to everything and and internalizing everything. None of us internalize anything, do we? We internalize everything. And once we have something, we don't want to let go of it. I'll tell you, that's one of the most valuable lessons God has ever taught me. Let go, let go, let go. Because when we do, you'd be surprised what God can give you back. You know, the the apostle here, Peter, he spoke to Jesus and he said, but we gave up everything to follow you. And Jesus says, I tell you, what's he say? Let's look at that scripture. He says, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers, parents or children for the sake of the kingdom who not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come, eternal life. I look at this and I need to tell you something. When I became a Christian, I lost 85 to 90% of my friends because my friends would not or could not come along with me because their lifestyle said, no, we aren't going there. And I loved them enough to let them where they were, and I continued on. I used to go back and try and visit them, but that became so hard and so difficult because I was looked at with consternation. But I still loved them. In fact, to this day, I still pray for all my old friends. And it's amazing because every now and then I'll run into one of them or they'll call me or whatever. And it's amazing how their lives have changed. And several of them have become Christians as well. And I do praise him, Whitey. Because the whole thing is, it's a ripple effect as to what we do with our lives. If we pour it out, people are going to change. But I lost friends. I lost family. I sold my farm. I lost it all to come into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But I want you to look around because he gave me a family. He gave me brothers and sisters. He gave me wealth beyond compare. You folks out there on the internet, you're part of that. You're like my extended family. You know, those second and third cousins that you never hear from? Yeah. (laughs) But you know they're there. This is what he's given me. It's a kingdom. And it's not just us. It's the other believers throughout this world. I am one of the richest men in the world. He called me rich when I was born, and now I understand it. Perspective. Get your head around this. Get your head out of yourself and get your head and heart into Jesus Christ. And the things of this earth, you will be able to give them away and think nothing of it. And God will bless you back. 30, 60, 100 fold. Is that not his promise? I think it's one of the most amazing concepts. Because when we learn this concept, when we learn this concept of perspective, all of a sudden, we realize one thing. The proper perspective perspective leads to contentment. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, 
to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 11 through 13. Paul here is speaking to the church at Philippi regarding the fact that they have come back unto him with a wonderful offering and, and, and everything that's coming because for a time, Paul was alone and no one was supporting him and, and he was really down. But now all of a sudden, this church has come back and, and has sent a gift to him to help to invigorate him. And these are Paul's words to the church at Philippi. He says, not that I speak from, what, from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In every and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. When we understand what Paul is talking about here, I want us to grasp something. Does Paul say, I like being in need? I like being in want? No, he did not say that. We need to understand, when we're talking about contentment, we're not talking about comfort. We as Americans, as people who have wealth, have come to the idea that our comfort means contentment. That's wrong. Because I'm going to tell you right now, God will take things away from you to get you to realize you're being more dependent upon those things than you are upon him. He's going to take that glass that's half full and he's going to pour it out himself until you turn to him and learn the secret of contentment. The secret of contentment means that you're okay where you are. Do I like where I are? No, not always. I'm going to tell you a story. I told you I have to live these things. Sometimes I don't like it. Yesterday at 9.30, well, actually it was about 9.15, I got myself ready to leave the house because it was about, I'm going to say quarter, quarter of nine, our phone rang. It was my daughter-in-law. She's down in Millsboro with her daughter and my son. Russell and Sawyer went fishing. They're 27 miles out in the ocean, so she can't get him by phone. She called Dad. She was hysterical. I said, Noel, Noel, what's wrong, what's wrong? Trigger bit Lily. I said, what? She said, Trigger bit Lily. Trigger, as you know, if you don't know, is my son's dog. It's Russell and Noel's dog. It's a German short hair pointer. He bit another person in our congregation three years ago. He bit Chris's daughter. We worked with the dog, took him to the obedience school. My son went through obedience school. The dog was doing well. Three years later, he bites a 19-month-old baby. I'm on the phone with her. I'm talking with her, and we go through a whole bunch of stuff, finally get her calmed down. I'm on the Internet looking for the closest ER, gave her the address. She's on her way. I went in my room. Lynn and I prayed. I went in my study. If any of you know me, when I go in my study, I shut the door, and I'm praying. And the Lord said to me, he said, Dad, what are you doing here? Your girls need you. So I got up, and I took off from Millsboro. Took me four hours to make that trip. I got down there. Noel was back. I stayed with Lily. She went to get medications and what have you. There's the dog. (laughs) Still in the room, acting like nothing happened. I mean, he was nervous, scared. He knew he messed up. And he was on his best behavior. And Lily's walking around all swollen up, 
Trig, 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 trig. My heart's breaking the whole time because I'm looking at the dog and I know he's a dead dog walking. We got to put him down. He's home now at my house because I needed to get him out of the house for my daughters. Yes, she's my daughter-in-law and my granddaughter, but please understand the biblical principle. They're my daughters. I also needed to get the dog out of the house for my son because the nuts don't fall far from the tree and I knew when he got home he was gonna take matters into his own hands and I needed to make sure that didn't happen, that he wouldn't do something stupid because I are him and he are me. So I did what dads do. I love the dog. I love my granddaughter. Is my cup half full or is my cup half empty? It's not my cup. How am I going to respond? My heart's breaking. My little granddaughter's face is all black and blue, all swelled up. I pray she doesn't have scars when she gets a little older and she probably won't because babies heal well. She already doesn't remember it because, like I said, she was running around chasing the dog and I had to keep them separated. So I put him outside because I didn't want anything stupid to happen again. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna be the man I need to be. Do what we need to do and move on. That's life. My cup is neither half full nor is it half empty, but I will enter into this as God has asked me to enter in and I will pour out. Last evening I was up until 2.30 because I didn't get home. I had to print the bulletins. I need you all know I go over my sermon one more time. So yeah, I'm running on very little sleep today. My insides are tore up. And I said, Lord, how am I going to preach today? And he said, this is what you're going to preach. Because this is where we all are. I'm dealing with a dog and a granddaughter and a daughter and a son. You're all dealing with a whole lot of other stuff. I don't know where you are. I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know what's going on but I know who has everything in his hands. And we know that God worketh all things to good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purposes. I trust that. And I will hold that in my heart. And to that I have learned to be content. Does it mean I like to be where I am? Do you think I'm happy? No, no but I'm okay. Because if I weren't, I couldn't be here today and I couldn't preach the love of God because he allowed this to happen. No, folks. We created a fallen world. Do you realize before the fall, man and animals got along wonderfully? Do you realize before the fall, there was no harm, there was no bloodshed, there was no disease, there was nothing. We created this mess. Blame God? Really? He has made the way. Before the foundations of the earth, Jesus Christ crucified. Because he knew what we were gonna do. He knew what we were gonna do. And in his making a way through his son, our savior, no matter what comes at us, we can learn to be, as Paul says, content. That I'm okay where I am, but I'm not gonna stay here. Do you get it? God wants us ever moving forward. And as we move forward, God leads us to the place where we can find transformation. And that's where I'm going to leave you today. Because I want you to think about this. 
It is from contentment, understanding where you are, being okay there, and looking to move forward that God can begin to transform who we are so that our glass is neither half full or half empty. It's His glass. And the perspective is mine. How shall I treat the glass that God has given me? Shall I treat it as He desires that I be pouring it out constantly? Or do I hold it and look for more? If you want more, you've got to give it away. Just like Jesus did. And I want you to think about that. What was the more that Jesus gave away his life for? Us. Each and every one of you. Each and every one of you who has accepted Christ or will accept Christ needs to understand you are why he did it. He loved you before you were ever created. He loved the idea of you from eternity past. He knew your name. He already had your name written in the Lamb's book of life. So when he looks upon you, he sees a glass full, not here on earth, but in eternity. That's what the eternal life is. That's a full glass. It doesn't get any fuller than that. But you and I got to go through this life. We've got to learn to have the proper perspective, and from that proper perspective, we can grow to contentment. Where we are, we don't have to like it. In fact, it's not liking it that will propel us to change. And that change leads to better. If, if, that's a big word, isn't it? It's almost as bad as I, but it's two letters. Because if, we accept it, and if we are willing to change. Would you pray with me this day? Father God, we thank you for the things that you do bring into our life. We pray, Father, that you would use them to your good pleasure to transform us, to help us to see that, that there is nothing that we cannot overcome if we have the proper perspective if we don't claim anything but give it all back to you because it's from you that it came, that all things would work to our good for it is the eternal end that you're looking for. And may our minds and eyes be off of the things of this world and the clamoring of them to the hope of glory, not just for ourselves but for all mankind that we would show the love of Christ through the pouring out of all that we are. Father, bless us this day. Move in our hearts. And for those who have received this message out there, Lord, we pray a special blessing that you would draw their hearts towards you in such a strong way that there is nothing that they would be afraid to give up because in doing so, they will gain all eternity in the name it is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You have been watching a Bible teaching from the Heart of Christ Church. You can find us on the web at www.theheartofchristchurch.com. If you have found benefit in listening to this message, you can send us an email from our contact page, or if you would like to donate or write to us, do so at P.O. Box 1011, Quentin, PA, 17083.